I would like to welcome you to my channel, That Middle Age Lady. My name is Denise, and in today's video, I wanted to give an update to several previous videos I have uploaded that went into detail of the journey I've been on, trying to figure out what has been causing some postmenopausal spotting, namely some grayish blackest discharge I would notice on my panty liner from time to time that sometimes would also be a light brown, so it would fluctuate between the two colors which is indicative of old blood that just takes longer to make its way out of the vagina. And then once it hits the air, it oxidizes and it gives it that grayish blackish or even that light brown tint. So although it doesn't look like the traditional color of blood being that red or even that light pink, it is still considered postmenopausal spotting. Just to give a quick recap, as these are all things that I've covered in previous videos, so if you haven't watched them, I hope that you'll check them out. But after I started to notice this discharge, I did immediately call and make an appointment with my gynecologist. Unfortunately, it was going to take six weeks to get me in. In the meantime, I also started to notice that I was getting some lower back pain that would radiate to my left side and felt like it was kind of coming from where my left ovary would be located. I was also starting to get quite a bit of indigestion, some gas, and some bloating as well. Concerned that something more serious might be going on, I did go to the ER where they ran some tests, including a CT scan, where everything came back normal. After that, the six weeks were up, it was time to go in and see my gynecologist, and after explaining to him about the discharge and all the symptoms I was experiencing, he did a pelvic exam and said that he didn't see anything of suspicion, didn't feel anything of suspicion, but because any type of postmenopausal spotting always needs to be investigated to try and figure out where it's coming from or what's causing it, he said that he wanted to set up an appointment to do a procedure called a sonohistriogram. Unfortunately, this time it was going to take two months for me to get in to have this procedure done. So in the meantime, as I continue to experience all my different stomach symptoms, I decided to make an appointment with my gastroenterologist just to make sure there wasn't anything going on with my colon or my stomach. He also ran several tests, including a colonoscopy, an upper GI, which is a scope down the throat, and then also a HIDA scan to test the function of my gallbladder. And after all of those came back normal, said that he had to agree with me that perhaps it was something female related. Eventually, the two months were up and it was finally time to go in and have this procedure done. But as the saying goes, whatever can go wrong will. And I woke up to this horrible snowstorm, but I thought there is no way I am going to let anything get in the way of finally trying to figure out what exactly is going on. So I basically white knuckled it all the way to the doctor's office, it took me much longer than what it should have. And by the time I got there, I thought if they take my blood pressure right now, I can guarantee it's not going to look too good. But then finally, they called me back to put me into an exam room. And then as I was walking back, I saw my gynecologist in the hallway talking to the lady who was going to be doing my vaginal ultrasound. And one of the things I like most about my gynecologist is that he has a very good sense of humor. At least some people would probably think that and likes to crack a lot of jokes. So as soon as he saw me, he kind of turned his back and said in a very loud voice, the patient is here now, so make sure and use the speculum that's really, really rusty and has the jagged edges on it, so it's going to hurt really, really bad. And then he turned and looked at me and smiled. And I said, you're lucky I have a good sense of humor or I would be running out of your office right now. I can't even imagine how some women might take his sense of humor. And so after I got into the room, she told me I could undress from the waist down and then I could lay back on the exam table, just like if you were having a pap smear. I put my feet up in the stirrups and then she took the vaginal probe, which is about probably five to six inches long. She put some gel on it and then inserted it into my vagina. At this point, she told me to look up at the TV monitor that they had so I could watch everything she was doing through the vaginal ultrasound. The first thing I noticed was what looked like my uterus, but then I also noticed kind of these darkened circles as well. Normally, I know an ultrasound tech won't answer your questions because they want you to ask the doctor. But I decided to ask her, so is that my uterus? She said it is. And I said, so what are those little kind of dark circles? And she said, those are fibroid tumors. You have several of them. At this point, the gynecologist came in and asked how things were going. She said, well, she told him about the fibroid tumors and kind of described them. And then also told him that the endometrial lining was of normal thickness, so it wasn't too thick. And then something had gotten said about my ovaries. I'm not sure if I said something or if he did. But then she said to him, well, no, actually, she does have something on her left ovary. Needless to say, my heart sank, even though um, it kind of gave me confirmation that here I had been saying all along, it felt like this pain was coming from my left ovary. So at least I knew I wasn't crazy. But again, at the same time, I definitely worried whether or not it was ovarian cancer. 
And so he asked her to move the probe closer over into that area so he could get a better look at it. And as he was doing so, I asked him if he could tell through that vaginal ultrasound whether or not it was, say, a solid tumor or a fluid-filled cyst. He said that he could and that it definitely looked like a cyst and then asked the ultrasound tech for the measurement of it, which she told him it was 9 millimeter by 9 millimeter, which converted into centimeters means that it is just under 1 centimeter, so it's very small. I asked him if it was anything that I needed to be concerned about, and he said that although it definitely looked like a fluid-filled cyst, that he really didn't have any way of knowing whether or not it was cancerous, but that I definitely had several things going in my favor. The fact that it was very small, the fact that it was perfectly round, since a tumor usually has irregular edges to it and it doesn't have the defined border like, say, a cyst would, the fact that it didn't appear to have any blood supply going to it, since that blood supply would be what helps a tumor to grow when it is a cancerous tumor, the fact that my endometrial lining was normal, and also that I didn't have any free fluid in my pelvis, which can be indicative of that cyst bursting, or even when you have uterine or ovarian cancer can mean that it's starting to spread to that tissue. He said that he felt like this was probably a cyst that I had had for a long time, but it was like a Rip Van Winkle situation where it had been lying dormant and then something came along and woke it up. But I had to disagree with him because I had had a vaginal ultrasound done two and a half years ago for a different issue and nothing had turned up at that time about any kind of cyst on my left or even my right ovary. So whatever had caused this had happened within the last two and a half years. I did tell him that, but he really didn't have much to say about it. I kind of felt like he maybe didn't even believe me. But I asked him if that were the case, then what exactly do you think could have caused it to wake up? And he said that he really didn't have any idea. I was diagnosed with vaginal atrophy at the end of April of 2023 and put on Vagifem as my course of treatment. So I asked him if he thought maybe the Vagifem played a role in it, and he said that he did not. However, I do know that estrogen is a food source for fibroid tumors and can help them grow. And considering during that vaginal ultrasound two and a half years ago, I only had one small fibroid tumor at that time, and now I had several. Obviously, something was bringing these things out. And the only thing I could think that was different between then and now was the fact that I was put on Vagifem to treat my vaginal atrophy. I definitely did worry about this cyst because of the fact that Ovarian cysts in postmenopausal women are definitely more rare than, say, from a woman who still is going through her menstrual cycle, since when a woman ovulates, that egg goes into the follicle, and then if that egg doesn't rupture from the follicle, it can then turn into a cyst. But postmenopausal women are no longer ovulating, therefore there are no more eggs that they're releasing, and then that's the reason why it's more rare to see one of these cysts in postmenopausal women, and why when they do have one, it can definitely raise their chance of being cancerous or becoming cancerous. Because I was there to try and figure out what was causing this postmenopausal discharge or spotting, I asked him if he thought perhaps that cyst might have caused it, and he said he didn't think so. So really, the only thing that would have left were the fibroid tumors, which all the research I've done shows that they definitely can cause bleeding, they can cause lower back pain, it can also cause some sensitivity wherever the fibroid tumors are located at, and it can even cause some bloating, all of which I had been experiencing. But yet, for some reason, he wasn't addressing the fibroid tumors, and I think his main concern at that time was definitely this ovarian cyst and trying to make sure that it wasn't cancer. But it was still frustrating because here I had waited all this time to get answers, and yet I felt like instead all I had was a lot more questions. At this point, he said it was time to do the second part of the procedure, which was where he would insert this tube in through the vagina up to the uterus and then fill the uterus with a saline solution. That way he could get a good look at all the layers up in there. And as he was doing so, he told me if I wanted to look up at the TV monitor, I could watch what was going on. And I have to say it was very interesting to watch it slowly begin to open until eventually all I saw was kind of like a dark cavity. He said he didn't see any polyps, he didn't see any tumors, he didn't see anything of suspicion. And that part of the procedure wasn't troublesome at all. I didn't even realize that, to be honest with you, that he was doing it. And then he said it was time for him to take a little sample of the lining so that he could send it away for a biopsy. And which is basically the same thing you would do during a pap smear, since some of that tissue or those cells can be cancerous. And the only way to know is if you have them looked at underneath a microscope. That part of the procedure was extremely painful, unexpectedly painful, 
And I immediately said, you know, oh my gosh, that hurts. And I really felt like getting up and getting down off of the table. Normally I have a very high tolerance for pain, so I'm not sure why that hurts so much or if every woman would experience that. But all I can say is that although this really only took maybe five to 10 seconds for him to complete it, it felt like a lot longer. I think that he definitely was concerned over the fact that he was hurting me. And I do think he was doing his best to just hurry up and get it done. And then afterward, he said, okay, you can sit up and we're all done. After that, they left the room so that I could get changed. And then he came back in by himself and asked me if I had any more questions. I asked him, okay, so where do we go from here? And he said that they would do the CA-125 blood test before I left the office and that it would take about a week or two to get the results back. And then he wanted me to come back in for in six weeks to have the vaginal ultrasound repeated. So I do already have an appointment set up for February 28th. And then he said we would have to wait and go from there to see what both of those you know, things showed, whether or not the CA-125 level was raised and whether or not the cyst seemed to be growing. The only other question I had was, let's assume this is just a simple cyst, what type of treatment would you then have to try and get rid of it? And he said that at that point, if it is just a simple cyst, that he really doesn't like to do any kind of surgery to remove it, since that can open up a whole nother can of worms and create even more problems. But in my mind, I feel like I don't need it anymore, so there's really no reason to keep it. And if he doesn't do anything about it, then that means I'm gonna to have to constantly worry, is the cyst going away? Is the cyst coming back? Is the cyst turning into cancer? And I feel like that stress is gonna be a lot worse than taking the, you know, having the surgery and taking that risk of having him remove that ovary. And so that is something that after I get all these results back, I'm definitely gonna to talk to him more about once I go in to see him again. But the other aspect to that is that I'm in pain. I have pain every single day of my life. If I move a certain direction, I feel it. If I kneel, if I sit, I feel this pain. And so I can't even imagine having to go the rest of my life feeling this pain. Not to mention the fact that I'm still having this vaginal spotting. And so where is this coming from? I understand that he wants to make sure this isn't cancer. And I agree, that's the number one important thing that we have to rule that out first. But then after that, it's time to try and figure out, are the fibroids causing this spotting? Are the fibroids causing my pain? I understand the cyst is small, but the ovaries are only the size of an almond. So even a very, very small cyst, I feel like could still cause pain. And so again, I have no problem getting to the bottom of making sure this isn't cancer, but then from there, it's time to finally get some answers and not only get some answers, but to have some type of resolution. I definitely feel frustrated that of all the people that I told about where this pain was located and how I really felt like it had something to do with the left ovary, my nurse practitioner didn't believe me, the ER doctor didn't believe me, gastrologist was so set on it being the gallbladder that thank God for the HIDA scan, otherwise my gallbladder would be removed and come to find out there was nothing wrong with my gallbladder. And then even the uh, gynecologist, the first time I went in, I said, I kind of feel like this might be related to my left ovary. And he said, no, no, you don't have any of the symptoms. If anything, it might be uterine cancer. And so that's something we need to make sure and look into. Thus is why he wanted to do this procedure. But had he set this vaginal ultrasound up sooner, then he would have seen the cyst on the ovary. And I feel like we could have moved more in that direction instead of wasting so much of this time waiting to have the sauna histogram done. I just think that making somebody wait this amount of time, like I've had to wait, just creates so much more stress and worry than what they need. And I feel like that stress and worry is just as bad as the physical symptoms and certainly can make them worse. And so at this point, I definitely feel frustrated with the whole entire process. I get the doctors, you know, are educated and that they're knowledgeable and that they have a lot of experience. But the one thing that doctors don't have is the ability to get inside of our bodies with us and to be able to feel what we feel and to be able to think what we think. So I feel like us telling them our symptoms is enough that they need to listen and understand that nobody knows our bodies better than we do. And the fact that I educate myself and I know certain terminology and I know certain facts, I feel like that almost frustrates him, almost like he thinks I'm trying to self-diagnose myself. But at the same time, I wasn't wrong. All along I've been saying, I really feel like whatever is going on is in the left side and maybe it has something to do with my ovary. Nobody wanted to listen. And yet at the end of the day, lo and behold, it had everything to do with my left ovary. So again, this whole process has definitely been very frustrating. At this point, all I can do is wait to get the results back of the CA-125 blood test and then to go back in and have the ultrasound done. And then from there, I guess we'll have to decide what my treatment plan is, depending on what they're going to find. 
So I will definitely be back at that time to give everybody yet another update. I feel like that's all I do is update because I don't ever really have any answers. But if you are somebody who has experienced any type of postmenopausal fibroid tumors or a postmenopausal ovarian cyst, I would love to hear about it. So I hope that you would share your story. Or if you have any questions or comments in general, please feel free to leave them and I'll be happy to answer anything that I can. Other than that, I just want to thank you so much for tuning in and for supporting me, and I will definitely look forward to being back in another six weeks.